Welcome back. You're watching Duke of Scopy TV. I'm Darren McDermott. I'm joined today by Carl Gustav Lunden from the IUCN International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And today we're going to take a look at grey whales. Welcome today. Thank you very much. So first of all, let's have a quick look at some of your recent projects you are working on. So we try in IUCN to engage with companies that want to do the right thing in the environment. Uh, one of the biggest sectors, of course, that are impacting the environment is in the oil and gas sector. So a few examples. Uh, in Mozambique, there's been big new finds of gas. So we're working to try to find a mechanism of dealing the, with some of the risk factors that are coming up, be it noise pollution, be it uh, effects on coral reefs, for example. Mm -hmm. In Yemen, we've been looking at the Yemen LNG, which is the largest industrial project in Yemen's history, dealing really with displacement of corals. So a number of the corals were affected when this big operation was being built at the LNG plant and we've been monitoring and assessing what we can do to improve on the situation on the ground. We also looked a little bit at the Niger Delta. Arguably this has been one of the places where there's been a lot of social conflict but also a number of significant environmental impacts. IUCN has tried to advise the company and the government to find a better way forward in terms of some of the risk factors there. And looking at seismic surveys and these can have can actually damage whales and be very, very detrimental. But of course, they are used for gas when um, gas is found. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about this and what are you working on to help prevent and, of course, protect whales? So I think it's hard for us to imagine living here on, on land what the kind of noise levels are on the ocean, but they're incredibly loud noises. Okay. This is used so that we can go through the subsoil and understand the uh, configuration of, of the gas deposit. Now, these type of sounds need to be made on a regular basis, so it's not just three-dimensional, in fact it's four-dimensional. We need to know what's happening to the deposit during its lifetime, which of course means there's a repeat of these very loud noises. Now, marine mammals communicate largely through sound. If you think of it, how would a whale find another whale, for example, to mate? Well, it gets really tricky for them if they can't hear each other. So if they damage their hearing, they're sort of lost and they won't find their kin. If they're also too close to the source, in fact, the noise is so loud mm. that you can have internal rupture and you can even kill animals. So this was a very big issue. And of course, the Russian government, together with the company Sakhalin Energy, was very keen on finding a solution to avoid damage to the whales. So about 10 years ago, they asked my organization, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, to address this issue. So we put together some of the best wild whale scientists in the world. The intention here was to really help uh, the company to get the best advice that they could in an independent fashion. So this would be done in such a way that the, the company could really say, OK, well, we've done the best we could to protect these whales. I'm happy to report that 10 years ago, there were population in the Sakhalin shelf uh, was about 120 whales. Today, we assess it to be at least 155 whales. So there's been a significant increase in the number of whales in this area, which actually was much better than anyone dared to hope at the time. That is great news. And looking at Mozambique, where they found new gas, can you tell us a little bit more about this and how you are going to protect the whales? So in Mozambique, we have uh, a, a big migration corridor. For example, you have humpback whales coming, migrating down to the Antarctic. Uh, you have a number of other beaked whales, you have dolphins. So a number of different whale species occur in this area. These animals, again, need to communicate. They bring up their young in these areas. So they're also very sensitive. Now, the companies we know are very sensitive also to investors and what investors think. And investors don't want to have dead whales floating around. That's bad publicity for everyone. And of course, it's obviously a really bad thing to do. So what we've tried to do is engage with the companies to find solutions for them, to help them uh, set in place protocols, standards that actually uh, mitigate some of the risk factors and reduce the overall threat to the animals. And we are so seeing something similar in Yemen as well, is that correct? Well, in Yemen, we've more been dealing with a healthy uh, system of reefs. And some of the reefs in Yemen are very special because you have huge temperature fluctuations, which means these reefs are used to coping with very stressful environments. Whereas in other parts of the world, 
the temperature on a coral reef tends to be very stable at around 28 degrees and it might vary one or two degrees. In Yemen you have large fluctuations, maybe more than 10 degrees. Now, in some ways this makes these reefs more resilient. These reefs can cope with some type of changes. However, they are still vulnerable to disturbances. So that's why we've been trying to work with the company and the government to find a fair solution that's good for the reefs and good for the company and good for the country. And moving on to Nigeria. Now, it has a huge problem with oil spills. So tell us a little bit about this. So in the case of Nigeria, Shell Nigeria came to us and said, can you give us some independent advice? What can we do to minimize some of the risk factors? So we've done a fair amount of assessment to try to understand where the um, real problem lies. Um, there are chronic spills. Often they're associated with blowing up of the pipeline, tapping the tapping the pipeline to actually get access to oil. So there's a whole sort of industry of people that can de facto steal oil from the pipelines and that then spills out and you get a, a big messy situation there. So over a long period of time, these, the amount of oil that's been spilled is significantly larger than, for example, the Deepwater Horizon spill. However, it's been in smaller increments, uh, but the toxicity and the problems associated with this are very significant and the company and the country and local leaders all acknowledge this. So what we try to do is come up with practical and fair ways of dealing with this problem to try to move forward to mitigate some of the environmental impacts. And looking at investing in this field and funding, what are your biggest challenges and who are your financiers? So I think most of us would say that, you know, this is a cost that should be borne by the companies. It's obviously their interest to go in in these areas and exploit the resource. Consequently, they need to, much as they build the facility, they also need to take care of the associated issues, be it uh, impacts on people, be it impacts on nature. So that's the basic premise of all what we do is we work with the companies to try to find solution and they should self-finance that part of it. Now, there's also an interest from some of the investors. So in some cases, the investors also have a consortium. It could be banks, it could be investment firms. And they basically uh, then say, well, you know, as investors, we also need an independent assessment. We need to make sure that what's being done is the best that can be done so that we don't put our investors at risk. And that can then also be a funding source. They want to make sure there's a due diligence that uh, the company is actually following its own rules or the government regulation. And then, of course, you have a number of environmental groups that are very concerned, be it of the whales or be it of other types of issues. And many of them then fund individual projects associated, for example, of understanding the dynamics in populations or trying to work with the different scientists to improve on the knowledge base so we can make more and better informed decisions on this. And finally, I think you have some foundations that have a strong interest also, a long-term commitment to reforming the way certain sectors are operating. And they then work hard to find ways of improving how things are being done. And this is an attractive proposition for them as well. With a small amount of money, they can see a big impact on the environment. It was great having you in the studio today. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. And thank you for watching Dukascopy TV. Do stay tuned as we have plenty more interviews like this heading your way. Goodbye for now.